to see. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> that, that's a, that you take care of. Should, should we close one more? Uh, <laughs> keep it open for at least one. Yeah, yeah but I think this one maybe for the light is better. Ah, okay. <laughs> at least the main Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I am Claudio Conti and Sergei Gulitsin and Sebastian who is standing in the window. We are the real ones. Uh, yes, we are, we are the I suspect team. football. I mean. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you don't come it's so you don't know. So, <laughs> Stefan Babinitz will, uh, will uh, reach out on Wednesday, probably. And uh, so, we are very happy to be here, especially because this is the first time for me again in Como after the. Covid uh, issues and things like that. So we made the first edition of this school uh, last year that was completely online, but very interesting. In the meantime, the field is exploded. I guess most of you that are interested to the topic uh, can see a lot of scientific publications, conference and things going on. And there are many, many directions uh, from uh, combinatorial optimization to real machine learning to image communication to the applications that, that we will see. So it's really an exciting uh, field of research that is huge and growing very, very fast. Indeed, we had a lot of applications. Uh, we were able to admit on site uh, most of, of the applicants, but unfortunately, we, had to not, we have, did not have the possibility to accept all the, all the persons. So we have a, a few persons online that, that will follow the, the talk. But I think it, this is a great uh, uh, conference for me, very, very, very exciting. I want to thank the, the speakers, and I also want to thank the participants, the students or researchers that decided to, to apply and, and, be, and be here with us. So concerning the, the organization and the program, uh, our attitude is to take it easy. So we didn't want to make a very tight conference with many, many, many talks. We prefer to have a, a sort of loose program uh, of a certain uh, program that leaves space for discussion, interactions, networks, ideas, and so on and so forth. So please relax and, and enjoy the, the talks and, and the discussion. We also have two poster sessions that actually are named poster sessions, but they also work for discussions or whatever you want. So, if you have a poster with you, you are super welcome to, to uh, show the poster and discuss with the people. If you do not have a poster and you want just to attach your paper or, or the, the first page of your paper, just do that. This will be the starting point and the seed for many, for many discussions. And if you do not have an either a poster nor a paper, just go ahead and stop people, discuss and, and, and interact interact with us. Uh, last thing that I want to say, today we have a welcome reception that Stefan is missing, I think that's for him. Uh, and so today at, at 7 p.m. there will be a welcome party with someone uh, here. here. Yes, downstairs, but where we are going to have the, the coffee. Event. So thanks a lot again for, for being us. Uh, I guess that uh, people online can hear me. And I also guess that they can interact. I mean, after the talk, they, they can um, make some questions, maybe directly speaking on their connection or just writing the, 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 the question online. Uh, that is still a tricky point because we still have to handle these hybrid the conferences. And as you know, it's always a mess, but we will try to do our best. So thanks a lot. I want to leave some <laughs> the room for our uh, my organizer. You want everybody to should say something. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, machine learning and photonics are very naturally connected, and I think you most of you know why. Because machine learning is good for big, huge data uh, sets, and photonics is uh, the best way to produce them, especially ultra fast photonics. So can produce huge data in a very short period of time. So machine learning and photonics will be going together for a long time, I think. Also, if you are from machine learning side, uh, you can enjoy that photonics is doing many things in parallel. So I believe it will be some new developments in machine learning uh, focus on parallel processing, data processing. So I think photonics will also contribute in changing machine learning. And uh, this school, um, I'm 
Second time here, first school was nonlinear photonics, I want to say. Sorry, yeah. I like to be <laughs> so it, it is indeed a uh, second one and first in person. And um, I think it's a great opportunity for all of you uh, to, to talk to people who will deliver lectures. You, you see it is a set of top people in their fields. And school is built in a way that you can have a lot of time with them. Yeah, share your ideas, ask about uh, what they are going to do and build some networking and also among yourself because you are a future generation of leaders, I believe. So it's important that you will see each other in 10 years and 20 years and you will remember this school as a school where you met first and start talking. And yeah, I have some <laughs> loosey um, idea about, <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, so science uh, started from very uh, single sort of people who did something and consider yes, research as a neuron, huge neuron, which fire some knowledge. So, and I think uh, in a sense, science now moving to this neural network approach because you fire some knowledge, it is shared with different ways because you can publish in a with a paper and it will be shared with many people. Yeah, some people still find you, maybe your friends, maybe people who trust you. So, and then this knowledge is accumulated and then next neuron fire another knowledge. So I believe this it's a losing uh, yeah, idea, of course, but yeah, anyway, I, I made some connection. Okay, enjoy and do a lot of networking and I think it will be really good for everybody. Yeah. Okay, maybe I can just uh, add a few words to, uh, to Claudio and Sergei. So, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm I'm Sylvain Gigant from uh, from uh, um, uh, Laboratoire Professor Rosset in Paris, and I'm also very excited to uh, to organize this school with uh, with you guys and to have you all here. I uh, I want to add just to what was said that. I find it uh, amazing that you could get three really speakers from different backgrounds, from quantum, from imaging, and I think there will be a lot of uh, a lot of connection building up. So uh, the, the diversity, I think, of this school is, is really great. But I think also for the, the young people, I really want to encourage you to engage again with each other and with the speakers and take a, a advantage of all this time we have uh, around the talk. Ask questions. We have one hour slots. So you know, take, take advantage of that and don't be shy. And I'm also actually uh, very uh, happy to learn because I think uh, many speakers uh, are from different backgrounds from myself. So I'm also personally very happy to learn and to be here today. So uh, uh, enjoy the conference. Uh, unless Stefana is online and wants to say something, we should start. Um, let's try to speak to him. Stefano, are you online? <laughs> Stefana, are you with us? No. Do you <laughs> 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 We should check if uh, people online can interact. Yes. 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 Okay, should we should we start with yeah. advanced? Let's let's. Uh, oh, yeah. ah, yes, I, I, yes, I have another another thing to say for you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, so I will say slowly, slowly, slowly. very slowly. I can also make some Python and rounds. <laughs> so, no, but so many speakers asked me uh, how much I have to to speak, uh, how much time for questions. So. Uh, I don't know. Actually, I, I would uh, love to, I would uh, ask the speakers to, to decide for themselves. So, as a general guideline, say speak for 45 minutes and let 15 minutes for, for questions. But this can be different. And in general, even if speakers should stay in the proper time slot, I think we can be a little bit uh, so uh, elastic. And, and, and leave time for questions as far as uh, it is possible, reasonably possible. So that is one general guideline. 
Another uh, question that I have from speakers is, should I make some kind of didactic talk or should I say, uh, uh, just enlist my achievements and things? Once again, it's up to the speakers. So if you want to be uh, a teacher and explain some concepts, do that. If you prefer to make a list of your achievements to engage the audience and say, create some excitement, it, it's the same. So uh, do what you want. You believe it's, uh, it's the best for, for yourself and, uh, and for the school. Same applies for the, for, the, for the participants. If you have some questions or some interactions, I would in general prefer that these are done at the end of the talks. So do not interrupt the speakers. Unless speaker feels OK, unless, it, unless the speakers wants that. Uh, because this also helps other people to follow the speakers without many, many interactions in general. But this is also left to the, to the, to the speaker. And do, do not refrain a typical uh, recommendation that you can hear. Do not refrain from doing questions. So let, let, do all the questions that, that you want. And uh, in particular, because this is a school with many, many different talks. So we will uh, touch a lot of different topics, which is uh, interesting from one side, but maybe not exciting from the other side. Because if the talk is far from your knowledge, it, it may be not, not interesting. So it's, it, it, it is an interdisciplinary school. So, let's, so for this reason, I think that everybody should make any question, even if uh, there is no knowledge or even if this, the question seems too, too simple, do that. Do not worry. Please do questions as much as you want, because we would like to, to, to interact. Uh, I, I, as I have to, to do an my <laughs> till nine, so I can say whatever I want. And so, <laughs> for example, I, I didn't like too much the, the Zoom uh, conferences. I think that most of you participated to, to conferences full online, and that is the, one of the so terrible experience in my, my career. Uh, I have participated to online conferences that are really terrible and totally useless. I don't know if my uh, yeah, colleagues can, can agree with me. It's silence. Yes, it's silence. No uh, in the way way it's it's uh, 10 people online, and all, nine of them doing other things. So that was really a terrible experience. It was somehow uh, challenging me. And so I hope now we, we must uh, change this. So we must uh, try to enforce and empower a conference with a lot of interaction. So, the, so sorry for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, sorry, so, you so if you have other, other, other student, if you have other student of black things uh, that, that you want to see, please go on. Uh, and that's it. So uh, okay, we have ten minutes. So uh, someone wants to say something. Just questions. Yes, please go. Let's go. Just Maybe we have ten minutes. Ten minutes. Just, yes, so that's good. Okay, so. Okay, yes, so I can do it. Yes, so I'm doing a lot of uh, machine learning with computing and uh, with, with optics and applying machine learning to imaging. But also, uh, yes, tell about your industrial. Yes, and because also I'm like, a, a co-founder of uh, Company of Optical Machine Learning, and uh, like uh, uh, Laurent Baudet will be the, the last speaker today and mm -hmm. some of this. Yeah. My name is Igor Kostov. I'm one of the students of the I'm doing uh, some work for nonlinear uh, non uh, communication ones and uh, another some theory for optical communication ones. <laughs> I'm a professor of and I work in the Institute System in Spain, and I started working in public machine learning in the last couple of years. I would like to have over all five first speakers, so we can <laughs> Uh, I'm really well. I actually work with Silicon on a better model to computing. And uh, yeah, it's a mix of optics and uh, My name is Peter Slade. I'm a PhD student at Aston University and I also work with some machine learning and with it uh, every night. Together with you a talk about the yeah, experience. I'm Peter Slade. I'm Peter Slade. I'm 
uh, the locating base and Hello everyone, my name is Philip Schulzen. Uh, I'm from Heidelberg, Germany, and I'm also working in Wolfgang's group uh, about uh, photonic integrated circuits. Uh, yeah, I'm Wolfgang Hanni, so we, we work with integrated photonic circuits on two of computing. My name is Victoria Ruskia, I'm from Marzenberg, Germany, and I'm and uh, I do experimental research about quantum dots, uh, lightning interaction, and the circuits. I'm Lars Sommer from Dunbar University in Finland, and I work on machine learning for just fast the uh, wider optics and super good I'm also from Dunbar University. I work in the I have a and Carlo. I work in the Central Technology I find very new to the topic because before I was working in quantum electronic systems and I know almost nothing about uh, machine learning and I'm here to learn. Last one, so another one, but I think I come from the uh, multiple quantum optics, so also from quantum information in the last year, as it has been analyzed quantum machine learning, all of the things that is called machine learning all the And, oh, yeah, sorry. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Gonzalez. I'm a professor of PhD student working in microcomputational optical elements, and I'm here to learn how to optimize my classes. So there, there are still some people online, so maybe uh, 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 for the people online, if you can uh, unmute yourself and, 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 uh, and uh, quickly introduce yourself. I, I'm sorry because I guess you don't hear the, the audience very well. So I think I would add that uh, uh, by recommending the speaker to repeat the questions when you get questions from the audience, so the people online can hear them. And I, I don't see the list of uh, participants. Maybe I can have, okay. So, Alberto Mazzarotti, is he? Ah, okay, that's you. So, that's uh, there's, uh, Daniele, maybe you can introduce yourself. If you're here. Okay, let's continue just in case. Denis Stanev, can you introduce yourself, maybe quickly? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Denis Stanev. Uh, I'm a PhD student from the Grand Sasso Science Institute. And my area of research is mainly optical quantum computation with an interest in, qu in quantum machine learning. And I hope to um, learn a bit more on that here. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Elisa Grassi, if you're here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I am a PhD student in uh, Kaus University in Saudi Arabia. I was actually supposed to be there, but uh, I couldn't make it due to some work-related uh, reasons. Uh, I mostly work in uh, uh, stimulated Raman spectroscopy and continuous Raman spectroscopy, and also on 3D microfabrication. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, where am I? Uh, James Cummins. Hi there, I'm a uh, PhD student at the University of Cambridge. Uh, working with Natalia Berloff on unconventional computing systems. Perfect, thank you. So, Li Zhang. Yes, I'm a student, I'm a PhD student at DTU Photonic. I'm working on space optical communications with machine learning. Um, currently, I'm working on prediction problems for machine learning in optical communications. Okay, thank you very much. So, Luca Talandier. I'm not sure if he's here. Okay, Marek Kozan. If he's here. Okay, maybe he's not in front. Okay, and Mariano Devigili. Hello, good, uh, good morning. I am a PhD student from uh, Universidad Politecnica di Catalunya. And my area of research is in optical failure management with the assistance of the help of machine learning. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I think we are, we are done, unless I forgot someone and someone can unmute himself. But otherwise, I uh, suggest we, we, we start.
So the first speaker is uh, Natalia Berloff from University of Cambridge, and she has, the, of course, the difficult task to kick off the, yes, the first yeah, talk well, of the meeting. So welcome, Natalia. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you organizers, for this beautiful venue and for this um, what sounds as going to be exciting conference. Even from this little introduction, it's clear that we're roughly in two different camps. So one uses machine, photo machine learning for photonics to discover something about photonical and optical systems. And the other part is using photonics to compute or to use photonics in machine learning um, accelerators and, um, um, and integrated circuits. So I would like to, so I belong to the second camp. So I will speak about um, using light optics photonics to compute. And I will be focusing on optimization but uh, clearly, there are very uh, clear connections between machine learning and um, optimization tasks. Actually, at the core of these um, uh, lie exactly the same, the same basis, the same mathematical, mathematical formalism. So I would like to start by acknowledging my brilliant group. And in my talk, you will um, hear that there will be cited papers. The main authors would be Kirill Kalinin who is now with Microsoft after successfully defending his PhD. Nikita Stoyev, who also postdoc, who just moved to work with me, Davidson and Weizmann. You heard James from online, Marvin, who is in this audience, and Irat, who is also online, and Richard, um, who didn't manage to actually even register or for participating online. He was quite, quite upset about it. Uh, but we'll, we'll tell him everything uh, on what, what is happening here. Okay, so um, actually, uh, personally, I, um, I was the author of this so, uh, machine that is now called the, as a polariton graph simulator, and with some preliminary in, in experiments uh, under the way. Um, also, I participate in this work with Microsoft, where we built um, the, this optical, optical ising machine that many other people and clouds is, um, is the building of the other perspective. But actually, I decided to steer away from any particular physical system for the purpose of this talk. I decided to be more didactical. Um, and uh, instead, I would like to give you a recipe. Uh, so if you have your favorite system, what do you need to implement to make the system compute? So what would be the necessary ingredients and what can your system actually achieve if you would be able to implement these ingredients? And they will be four, and I will discuss them. So first I'll start, I have to start with introduction, so I have to start with some, some pictures. So I'll talk about the whole idea of analog optical computing, but then I'll move shortly to wave conference and uh, co uh, coherence and mode selection as one of these ingredients that actually allow you to minimize the functional, to minimize a particular spin Hamiltonian. So I will uh, perhaps spend a couple of minutes talking about what we're minimizing and why minimizing spin Hamiltonian, such as the Ising Hamiltonian, the Xy Hamiltonian, or ports, or K local Hamiltonians actually help for optimization. I will speak very shortly about polaritons, simply because again, to deduct it with didactical point of view, I think it's, it's good to have something in mind, and then it would allow me to actually formulate the mathematical framework. But my talk, the, one of the main conclusions of my talk is that there is this canonical formalism that actually all other optimization machines that you hear perhaps in, that happening in literature, the coherent Isaac machine, the Shiba bifurcation, a um, uh, couple of mechanical oscillators, that, that all of these machines can actually be covered within the same universality, canonic, universal canonical um, complex model. That luckily for us, perhaps for people working in optics and photonics, that's what optic, nonlinear optics actually is capable of doing, um, physically realizing these universal canonical models. So everything else comes from our ability to control different parameters and allow um, these four ingredients that I'm going to talk about come into, into the fore. Okay, so my very short introduction to analog computing. We all know that before the era of modern computers, the analog computing was the, uh, the toy at the block, the key at the block. 
So we use the idea that integral circuits work according to differential equations. So we turn the table and say, if you would like to solve these differential equations, let's build the electrical circuitry that uh, solves this, these equations, that evolves according to these equations. But it's all changed with the, uh, the, with the era of digital computer, where instead we started using the classical gate operation. So we now we could really achieve the enormous precision. It became digital, and that completely changed the, the, the sceneries. It completely changed our world. For the last 20 years, perhaps one of the most brilliant ideas in physics was the idea that you can build the quantum computer, that you can use entanglement, that you can use quantum gates to build the universal quantum computer, or in the short term, you can use quantum tunneling and quantum annealing to build the quantum simulator again to solve some very specialized problems. The jury is still out, uh, is still, you know, didn't come out uh, to tell us uh, whether the quantum computer, even quantum simulators, will ever become of any use. In a recent announcement by DARPA last year, they already stated very clearly that they do not believe that quantum computer, quantum simulators will ever be to the scale and the requirements of at least that industry that covered by DARPA. So perhaps at least in the shorter term, the idea came about that we can use this quantum inspired analog, most likely optical systems to do to solve the specialized problems for us faster than the digital computer than the classical von Neumann architecture would ever be able to do. And to help us in these processes is the tremendous parallelism of the analog systems, low efficiency, uh, no, high efficiency, uh, uh, high bandwidth, low losses, etc. So very, uh, very efficient for, uh, especially for the optical systems. Also um, helps here our knowledge of the phase, uh, space structure of a particular system, especially if we ask the question that we just need uh, not the best solution, but at least something very close to it. So when we simply would like to find good solution fast, or the best solution within the limited uh, requirements you know, of time and, uh, and uh, power spent. Okay, and now I would like to give you one example that's a little movie, but before I'll show this movie, this is actually quite an impressive movie. And uh, let me just explain what you're going to see. The actual physical setup is not that important. Uh, but uh, I will show you polariton condensates arranged in triangular lattice, 100 condensates. But you can think about it that I inject, again, with a spatial light modulator, I eject particles, light particles. In this case, these are photons coupled with excitons in semiconductor microcavity. So photons coupled to matter. But this is simply for me to be able to control, for the particles to be able to interact and for me to visualize this movie, okay? So I create with the laser, the spatial light modulator, these particles in a triangular geometry. And then I let it evolve. I turn my laser off. And initially you won't see anything, and then on this panel, you'll see dark globes. These are density of these particles. And here you will see the Fourier transform. And then you'll see when the density becomes clear that I have this triangular lattice of something, of this dark spot, then the Fourier, uh, Fourier image will show you very clear peaks. That means that at this particular moment, there is a coherence across the system. Okay, so all these all this elements, yeah, yeah. all these condensates start talking in common to the machine learning school. We have yes. some people online here uh, which could use them that. So they will start talking to each other and they will establish a particular uh, a coherence. And the Fourier image shows you that now they have very clear phase differences between them. So these phase differences that the system spontaneously acquires actually solves a problem. 
it minimizes the XY Hamiltonian. So it solves the problem, which actually could be quite hard to solve. But the point is that the entire movie, in reality, takes about 100 picoseconds. So this 100 things will solve this problem almost instantaneously. And it solves different problems. One problem is solved here. Another problem is solved at this moment. And then because there is a dissipation in the system, everything decays. Okay, so this is what we are after. It's such a good point. So again, as you can see, the system started, but there is no coherence. The coherence is created here. Everything is coupled antiferromagnetically, so it's coupled with a particular strand, and the strand is about the same in the nodes. And then there is another moment when the system actually rearranges themselves. The coupling is different. It solves a different problem, and then maybe a third problem, but it's already kind of kind of vague by by that time. Okay, so what is happening there? What is the coherence is about? So we all know of this experiment. You probably have seen it in a different realization. I mean, one particular one when you just drop two stones in the water, and then there is a wave interference. But in this experiment, I actually create the wave in the water um, basin of the same frequency, and then I can see this interference better. I'm not, not perhaps that interesting. So each wave can be characterized by its frequency, so this is time, but only when two and the amplitude, but only if two waves have exactly the same frequency, I can talk about particular phase difference between them. And so if I start, so I can't do it in time, so I'll do it in the representation in space. So if you think of my Condensate, so about these entities where I created the particles, so each of those will have independent uh, frequency. So they just simply propagate with whatever, whatever frequency it decides to do. Unless I couple between them, and how do they couple? Imagine I created this big heap of particles, they start to propagate, they expand, they reach another side, they start interacting with these particles, so there is the cross talk between the guys, and we know in nonlinear physics that once we have these oscillators that are coupled, they can synchronize. They will acquire the same phase, and a particular phase difference will emerge. And that becomes actually this solution of the problem that you've seen before, the phase difference between, between the elements. This is another just pictorial representation of that. And these are two um, early experiments where we have, this is in the group of Jeremy Baumbach in Cambridge, where we pump, we create these condensates in the corners of equilateral triangle. You see this, uh, this lattice, actually the lattice of vortices, but it's not important, it's just interference pattern. But uh, because of there is a con uh, constructive interference between the spots, we understand that they are in phase. This also in phase and these are in phase. I will change either the intensity or the distance between them, and they can be a two pi over three phase difference between them. So that's what the minimum XY model actually tells us. And this is again the five hundred. This is the different experiments by Carlos Lagodakis from Southampton, where we have five condensates, and they are negatively coupled, interferomagnetically coupled, and you see this destructive interference between them. All right, so what, are, what can we hope to achieve with optics? Um, and you perhaps, again, there are several big classes of problems, and again, from the little introduction, there are people probably working in all these classes of the problems. Uh, there is this big, uh, big initiative, the big research going in the realm of optical quantum computing, when people use squeeze states, and um, trying to get uh, to solve different problems from rough isomorphism and boson sampling. Uh, of course, the optics is very promising for fast linear algebra, for instance, matrix vector multiplication, which is important in artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, deep learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
All to, these together, also other uh, people working with, in this audience on quantum optical neural networks. You can use optical reservoir computing for the image recognition, for the classification of tasks. But I will be talking about these optimizers. So how to use the optics to solve quadratic unconstrained binary optimization problem, phase retrieval, higher order binary optimization problem. And there is, of course, a clear links with associative memory, storage, and again, uh, uh, pattern recognition and classification tasks. But that's what my, my talk will be, will be about. OK. So what is the idea behind? So what are we trying, trying to achieve? It's a mathematically rigorous statement that pretty much every real life problem can be formulated. So, and there are some of, some of those problems from combinatorial optimization, because this is the problem when you're trying to find the best solution. So you're trying to find the global minimum of some complex energy landscape. And we know, again, this is mathematically rigorous statement, that uh, these problems can always be mapped into one of the universal spin Hamiltonians. By universality here, it means that it completely reproduces the low energy part of the spectrum. So it's actually these models reproduce not even just the ground state, but some of the excited states above it as well. And there are no universal problems such that Ising, so this is the problem on minimizing the Ising Hamiltonian on the graph, where the edges are some weights, and the node should be assigned plus or minus one. Another universal problem is xy, when again there are weights along the edges on the graph, but the nodes now can be any angle uh, theta on the unit circle. And there are different physical systems and different platforms that can achieve, can be built to achieve the minimum of these universal spin models. Because after all, the physics is dominated by these uh, by the spin Hamiltonian things, right? So first we, we know the equilibrium system, the equilibrium system such as, let's say, both action condensates, they're trying as cool, they're trying to achieve a ground state. So the ground state often can be written as such, um, such Hamiltonian. In optics, we deal with gain dissipative system. They're not Hamiltonian systems. So, but instead of minimizing its own Hamiltonian that doesn't exist, the system minimizes the losses. Again, going back to the concept of coherence, what the physics is trying to do, laser physics, optic physics, it creates the coherence when it can. So at, when you have enough particles to actually have this coherent state. In other words, it minimizes for any particular gain, it tries to minimize the losses and create the coherent state. Okay, so there are these two different mechanisms, I'm just going to cover this one. Okay, with this mathematical framework in mind, now when we are tasked with finding the global minimum of the function of in variables x1 to k, we map these variables into the phases and then minimize what is written here, the x, y, Hamiltonian. So you have the coupling strength between the nodes, denoted here as j, i, j. And then you minimize the sum over i over j of the cosine of the difference between the phases. So again, that traces back to the example that I showed you with polariton condensates. The system minimizes the cosine of the difference of the phases for the given coupling between, between the elements. But then these phases could be free to lie in the unit circle, so it could be anything between 0 and 2 pi, or these phases could be constrained to be 0 or pi, or they could be discrete in 2, 3, and then we have Pott's model. And of course, when you're trying to do this mapping, it would be beneficial for you to choose the universal model, as there are so many universal models, that actually minimizes this overhead. Because this is a big problem. You don't want to increase the size of the space of the variables that you operate into. 
So there is this famous uh, paper by Toby Cubitt in Science that says that given any NP problem, so from this class, uh, any problem, let's, let's say, you can always map it into universal Ising Hamiltonian with just na uh, nearest neighbor interactions on a 2D squared grid plus the fields. But the all you can always do that, but the overhead overhead will be polynomial, but it still would be quite large. Even polynomial functions can grow quite quite fast. And when you're trying to build the actual platform, you really want to keep this overhead to a minimum. Okay, so that's something to, to keep in mind. But why do we even go there and why classical conventional computing is not enough? Uh, the short answer is it all depends on the size of the problem you're solving and how difficult the problem is. So if we deal with the easy problems, the convex problems, it's very easy to find the minimum. You just follow the gradient descent, for instance. But it still becomes hard in machine learning setting because, first of all, the dimension, dimension is huge and you have to do it quite often. Even here, the classical computer will start having problems. The size quite, can, can be quite reasonable if the problem is medium hardness. Problem, for instance, again, minimizing Hamiltonian for spin glass. So spin glass meaning that you have different sign of the interaction and nearest neighbor interactions. But also, even for the order of 1,000, you can have very difficult problems. Uh, if, if you read really this difficulty, difficulty, um, if, for instance, you have the Isaac Hamiltonian, everything coupled with everything. So spin glass with, uh, with long range interactions actually would be, would be very difficult, take exponential time to find the, the best solution, and the classical computer simply cannot do that in a reasonable time. Another, another problem is energy efficiency. So this little diagram actually summarizes the computing power versus energy efficiency for different modern uh, frameworks and platforms. Some of them are specialized in the tender um, units and FPGAs. But we hope that unconventional computing hardware will actually be optim uh, will optimize both energy efficiency and computing power to actually do, uh, give us even better, better performance, therefore. Okay, why light? So again, uh, one more slide on why would you like to use the light for this, for this purpose? First of all, the light has two, usually has two degrees of freedom, the amplitude and the phase difference. So phase, phase and the amplitude. And the phase in this case becomes the bit, the unit of your computation, the variable, and the amplitude actually, this additional degree of freedom also helps and you will see that actually this different amplitudes for different oscillators will help your machine to achieve, to find the ground state. So that's something really helpful. It can be damaging, but it, it can be helpful as well. In optics, as I, again, I mentioned, there is this principle of finding the global minimum. This is, you know, you, perhaps you're familiar with that in terminology of the mode selection. Uh, or I mentioned loss minimization. So again, as you start creating, you start pumping up the particles of photons in your system, then you have to, you're, you're raising your gain until the function finds the global minimum, until it touches the, the landscape of the losses, and that's when the coherence takes place. I'm often asked, you know, these optical computers, these computer, photonic computers, polyatonic com computers, they're fully classical, aren't they? And my best response is that, you know, I'm thinking of the uh, establishment of coherence as the analog of the measurement in quantum system. So in other words, you have fully quantum system with entanglement with the quantum and classical noise that allows you to span a larger um, hyperspace of your system. That what allows you to actually scan the system for the best solution. But once the coherence is established, that's like the measurement in quantum system when the system becomes classical. Before the coherence exists, the system is not, is not, is not fully classical. So there, there should be speed up, but we don't know 
how much it actually helps in the search for the best solution. Um, unlike other solid state systems, the optics and photonics is easy to scale. Coherent Ising machine already operates with thousands, spin, thousand spins, photonic Ising machine. Claudio already produced 10 million, I think. But for simple problems. Like yes, yeah. Problems so. we have to yeah. But still, a comparison with uh, superconducting qubits, a comparison with um, everything Rigberg atoms, right? Um, in comparison with other, with ions. The optics offers this mobility that offers the scalability that are much easier to achieve. Um, it's possible to do these experiments at room temperature. In, even in our polyton condensate, we have samples that operate at room temperature. And very importantly, to make the problem hard, you would like to use this, you have to have in your system long range interaction. So you really, I mentioned that you can always map into just nearest neighbors interactions, but I forgot to mention that then you have, it's a mathematical result, then you have to have an infinite precision of your couplings. Because this is not possible to have an experiment, you sacrifice the precision, but instead you have to in large, you have to have this low, long range interaction. You have to couple the elements not beyond the nearest neighbors. So the further you go, the, the, the fewer elements in your system you can have to emulate a particular, particular problem. Okay, and so uh, this is a very active area of research. There are a lot of beautiful works that offers different, different platforms from coherent ising machine using um, degenerate optical parametric oscillators to um, injection lasers, to optoelectronic systems, photonic lattices, MEMS, um, MEM resters, um, and uh, Claudio with his photonic ising machine, of course, Neil Davidson with laser in the cavity platform, we contributed with our uh, uh, polariton condensate, polariton graph simulator platform. But all these platforms um, have actually common problems. They have common principles of operation, but they have common problems, and the solutions of these problems would also be quite, quite similar, I would say. Because once we understand the universality class, then we can see that you know the pro how to resolve these problems for all these platforms. Okay, so my one um, easy slide on polariton condensates. So because from now on, I would like to actually go into deeper into the mathematics of it until I reach this universality. And for me, polaritons, but again, it's close to my heart, so it kind of already in this, uh, this is really governed by, by, the, um, by the mathematics that seem, seemingly rules it all. So the mathematical model for the polaritons actually, as it turns out, to have all the necessary ingredients. And every other platform can be mapped onto it. Okay, so if you were, if you've never heard of polariton condensate, this is just one one, one slide um, on the physics of it. So, uh, polariton is a composite particle. It's a hybridization, the superposition of the photon and exciton. And exciton is an excited state of the electron in semiconductor microcavity. So, you create this very exquisitely manufactured layers of just few atoms thick of different materials. In our experiments, gallium, indium, aluminium, arsenic. And you do it in such a way that when you shine the laser, the exciton is created. So electron excites, leaving a hole behind. This is an excited state. So the electron, the uh, exciton spits out the photon, and because of the red reflectors, the mirrors, the photon gets reflected, becomes reabsorbed, again creates the exciton, becomes re-emitted reflected, reabsorbs, create an exciton. So that's how we would think about it classically, but this is quantum dynamics, quantum mechanics. So there is a superposition of states of the exciton and photon that gives rise to this quasi-particle called polariton. So part light, part matter. And it's a beautiful system and it's a beautiful particle because from the light, it inherits its lightness, right? And the speed of the propagation. 
So the mass of the polariton is uh, four to five orders of magnitude lighter than the electron, than electronic mass. But because of the coupling with the matter, the polariton has very strong nonlinear interactions. Polaritons are bosons, so they undergo the Bose-Einstein condensation, again, going back to the coherence of the system. But because it's so light, and the temperature of the Bose-Einstein condensation is inversely proportional to the mass, then the condensation occurs at relative warmth of the cryogenic temperatures. In our experiments, at about 5 to 10 Kelvin, but again, in other samples, organic samples, or polymer, or polymer samples, this could be at room temperature. The condensation, the bose einstein condensation occurs at room temperature. So I mentioned this superposition, this bouncing back and forth between mirrors and the cavity. But after bouncing back and forth, nothing is perfect in this world, so the photons leak through. They go through the mirrors. So there are constant losses, and the lifetime of, the, of, of these particles from few picoseconds to 200 picoseconds, depending on um, the uh, stru structure of the sample and actually how many layers of the mirrors you have in your system, the Q factor. So you can make it, you can increase the lifetime by several orders of magnitude. And because of that, you can, you can fill the gap between equilibrium and non-equilibrium systems continuously. So the lasers are very non-equilibrium. And both Einstein condensates and ultra cold atoms are in equilibrium. And by varying the lifetime, your, your lifetime of the platons, you can be here, 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 here. So you can be in any place continuously in terms of how equilibrium or non-equilibrium your system is. Okay, and you can make it more photonic, you can make it more oxytonic. So there is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, flexibility and a lot of control parameters for this system. Okay, for those of you who work in nonlinear optics, this equation is familiar, which is very well familiar, also to those who work in um, some um, uh, condensed matter, uh, semiconductors, etc. So to describe, uh, to describe the Condensate, which is a spatial, spatial, has spatial dimension and temporal dimension, we use the order parameter psi, that is a function of space and time. And then we have the usual terms from the nonlinear Schrodinger or Grossi Tadevsky, where we have the dispersion, diffusion, polariton, polariton interaction, bring about the, uh, the non cubic nonlinearity. Uh, then we have the reservoir. So these are non-condensed particles. So first we create the reservoir, and then there is a scattering into the condensate. So we pump this reservoir of the particles. There is a dissipation. We're losing particles right away, but also there is a scattering rate converting the reservoir particles into the condensate. So in the reason, therefore, the scattering also blue shift from polariton exciton interaction, so the interaction with the reservoir. And unlike nonlinear Schrodinger, unlike the Gross-Tanevsky equation, because of the gain and losses, we always have this gain because of this, because of the scattering from the from the reservoir, and we have the losses because our mirrors are not are not perfect. Okay. And actually, this all can be simplified to bring about the famous Ginsburg, I mean, hopefully follow you, Ginsburg Landau equation if I assume that the reservoir instantaneously reacts to what happens to the condensate. So I can assume the steady state and then find the expression for the reservoir. I can expand it, assuming that the density is low uh, using the Taylor expansion, and that gives me the Ginsburg-Landau equation. Or if I just substitute it as it is, I get the usual Maxwell block equation with a saturable nonlinearity. So, okay. So I mentioned, so this is why, remember, the first ingredient that we need to build the computer is the coherence. To be able to read the result, the system has to be coherent, okay? Now, this is the second ingredient that I also already mentioned several times, the loss minimization. So we have this energy landscape. 
So this is the landscape of the function that we would like to minimize. For us, it's a loss function. And then we start increasing the gain, which is facilitated by the bosonic stimulation because we are creating goes einstein condensate. And because we're moving from the load, hopefully the first state that we encounter is the global minimum. So this is unlike classical annealing, when we drop the particle and then increase the temperature and allow the particles to jump from the local minima and then decrease the temperature until the global, hopefully global minimum is found. It's also quite different from the quantum tunneling when we adjust the potential adiabatically so that the state remains at the global minimum, so turn off through the barriers. In our system, we minimize losses and mathematically it's clear what happens at this zero order approximation. So remember for my condensate, for instance, so this is the function that depends on space and time. And now I'll calculate the total number of particles in my, in my system. If I have a lattice system, I add n condensates, each characterized by the weight function psi j, psi j, and then I can expand this by pulling out the densities of the individual condensates and the cross-order terms. So the condensate in this spatial location, condensate at this spatial location, they have these cross terms that actually give rise to the interactions between the condensates. And just written down, this is from this, I can uh, assume that they all have the same shape of the, of the condensate, of the condensate wave function. I will pull out this cosine theta j minus theta k, which is the minimum of the xy, xy model, therefore. So if I maximizing the number of particles in my state. This does not depend on the interaction, so that's constant. So maximizing M minimizes negative of this term, minimizes the X, Y, But this is the zeroth order term. So let me move a little to, to the first order term. And to do that, now instead of thinking of the condensate as a function, which has spatial and uh, temporal dependence, now I will think of it as a number, as a complex number that has an amplitude and a phase. So now these functions depend on time only. And now I will use a whole time binding approximation when I integrate the spatial degrees of freedom from the ginsburg landau equation. And that gives rise to this. Stewart-Landau Landau equation, where the rate of change of the individual condensate of this individual oscillator depends on injection rate, the linear losses, non-linear losses, self-interactions, and the coupling, and perhaps the noise. So if I now run this as a dynamical system, and I will look at the fixed point of the system, then for the, uh, for the densities, I'll recover something that already is somewhat close to the xy Hamiltonian, except for this term. And for the evolution of the phases, I have something that reminds me of Kuramoto oscillators, again, except perhaps to this term. But this term is kind of has a dramatic difference on my minimization problem, right? Because if I reach the fixed point, or let's say if I follow the evolution by, by this equation, then I can see that I follow the gradient of the x line in the Newtonian, right? I have my sign. But it means that I'm minimizing not the function, not the Hamiltonian that I need to minimize this one, but the coupling strength are now modified by the densities that themselves at the fixed point depend on these expressions. So first of all, it's not even clear whether this fixed point will be achieved. And if it's achieved, then I solve the wrong problem. I solve the problem where my coupling strength modified by these densities. So to overcome this problem, this density heterogeneity problem, you, can, you have to introduce the feedback. 
So from time to time, you have to adjust the injection. So now the injection rate has to depend on the density of the individual of individual condensate and adjust it so that we bring all of them to the same value, let's say one at the threshold, this one-dimensional unit. So if my density of the IF condensate is below the threshold, I continue increasing the injection rate. But if it's exceeded this one, then I start decreasing it. And with this, at the fixed point, all the densities are one, so all these terms go away. And if I calculate the total mass, it would be just the number of oscillators times one, because I brought all of them to one. Then I have the total injection, total losses that also do not depend on anything, on the couplings. And here again, I have negative of my xy Hamiltonian, because these terms are fixed. If I always choose the minimum gain that I inject in my system, by this I am indeed minimizing the xy so with these two equations actually already gives me a very good solver for finding a minimal depth like Hamiltonian. And from the estimates that we did with Kirill Kalinin is that already at the order of 100 or 1,000 elements, assuming that we take the longest time it takes in our system to do this adjustment is about millisecond, we're already going to be quite uh, faster than any, any solver for this kind of problems. So we expect that about after 1,000 elements, um, our system can solve this problem faster than, than any, any other system. How much time do I have? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is, this is another. So let me, uh, let me go slightly deeper into why the system is, uh, performs so well. So this little illustration gives you the behavior of the densities. So this is the square of the modulus of my of the order parameter for the oscillator. Uh, these are the phases. This this how the gain operates for individual nodes, and this is how the minimum of the x y the value of the x y Hamiltonian changes. So in this simulation that done by Marden, so he took. 100 different different matrices with distribution of the couple is normally distributed between uh, uniformly distributed between minus 10 and 10 and this is just one particular realization and this is summary of the success probability on different matrices so this is if you depicted all 100 of them compared to the Monte Carlo simulation plus local local solver and as you can see that almost in all the simulations, this simple model finds the global minimum, except for these matrices, but for these matrices, actually the distance to the global minimum is extremely small. So it's very easy. Uh, so in, in any way, so in 100% of these matrices, the solution was good enough. Here you also have this first example of the bifurcation. So as you start ramping up the game, Initially, you don't have the condensate, so you don't have any coherence buildup. And then there is a moment when the bifurcation took place, so the densities start forming, the coherence starts forming, and then the old densities, because of this um, feedback, go to one, finding the solution to the, to the problem. Okay. The third ingredient, so I already mentioned two, the co wave coherence, Second, loss minimization that we approach from below. And now my third ingredient comes into place that because my densities are modifying, before I make them all equal, modifying the coupling terms, I'm doing the ternally. How I'm doing the ternally? So this is my final, this is one particular uh, uh, projection of the Hamiltonian onto just a single, single uh, uh, theta on the single phase. And this is the global minimum at, let's say, 4, 5, or 5. But if I started somewhere here, then I would simply follow the gradient descent, and I will find the local minimum. Within these formulas, so within this evolution of photonic networks, I find at this point, but my landscape has a different shape. I started at this point, I moved by gradient, 
the shape of the landscape changed again, and then I moved in the tangent line, changed again, I moved the tangent line, and then I reached, I reached the global mean. So the, 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 the difference, the non-heterogeneity of the amplitudes in my system, for which I really have to do this adjustment, slows down my system, but at the same time, it helps to avoid being stuck in the global, in the, in the low community. Coherent Isaac machine, that's another example, a very famous example, machine built by Yoshi Yamamoto in a degenerate optical parametric oscillator. So this is the same system, the optical system, but now the phases are either zero or pi. So if I use my system, the system of the oscillators, and assume that the phases are zero and pi, actually we get to this differential equation where xi is now plus or minus the amplitude of the phase, and again you have this cubic, um, cubic term. And then this is the, so in Yoshi Yamamoto experiment, you have this fiber, and you have the solitons, you have this wave packet of the equally spaced um, um, uh, waves traveling across the ring, and then you have a different way how to couple them, either by using FPGA or by using the delay lines, it really doesn't matter. So these element, uh, elements interact with each other, and they get established with the, the amplitudes that are either zero or a positive or negative, so phase becomes zero or pi. And by doing so, it solves the, you know, it finds the minimum of the isochronotonium. So this is a little, little example of that. So we have this so-called nervous letter graph of eight elements, uh, all negatively coupled. And then we run this simple system just to find which elements we should uh, be up, which element should be, should be spin up, which should be spin down, so which phases become zero or high. And again, you see this bifurcation behavior when in time you start with spins that have amplitude around zero, and then you ramp up the gain, and then you have the decision moment when different, different XIs decide whether they want to be positive or negative, and by doing that, they solve the X, well, the eyes in Hamiltonian. And that's, again, another example on a different structure where now you have some randomness introduced for the illustration. But of course, if we use, because of this very simple mapping from our model into this one, we can do exactly the same thing with the Stuart Landau uh, with our oscillators, but also we do even, uh, so we have this equal, equal amplitudes, exactly one minus one. So our method shown in dash, and this, uh, this, this model is shown in solid lines. Okay, another example, um, of course you, uh, you probably, those working with associative memory and machine learning, you recognize that uh, there is a relevance to the whole field networks famous uh, neural network, classical model of biological memory networks that was introduced in 82 by, uh, by Hopfield and then with Hopfield Tank, they used this model for solving different combinatorial optimization problem. And now there is a lot of research using these networks. Uh, so this uh, recent paper, Hopfield Network is all you need, uh, where you can uh, different modifications of this uh, these networks were used in uh, to solve different different tasks in um, in deep learning machine learning for the um, associative memory memory tasks as well. So probably I should I should be wrapping up. Uh, another class of neural networks and another proposals. This is Toshiba bifurcation machine also proposed as advantage um, as, as a better model for solving optimization tasks. Here, AT is again the annealing parameter that brings this term to zero when the minimization problem is achieved. This all goes back to adorno hoff oscillators that were used for as a proposal for the neurocomputer. Again, there are two types of the 
of the neurons. Uh, they have the self-activation, and then they have some coupling terms. Another example is a coupled microelectromechanical system, uh, also used for optimization tasks. Of course, it's just closely related to this one if you let yi be xi dot. And again, these systems all behave in a similar way in the sense that they achieve a solution to the problem because they have the bifurcation that brings the solution about. And when we have this variety of the different models, the variety of methods, the Hamiltonian uh, dynamics can be used to solve the spin minimization problem, we, we, we can ask the question of which system is uh, preferable, so which system should we use? And the answer to this is that actually they're all identical. Because in the neighborhood of this bifurcation, whatever type it has, you can map these elements, these x and y's, into the wave function and the conjugate of the wave function in our oscillator. So the most general model that you can have has this form. So this is the system that you've seen before. We have the evolution of the oscillator. You have gain, you have cell frequency, we have from the that comes from the, from the ejection rate. You have this uh, non-elastic non losses, you have self-interactions, and then you have some kind of coupling. The coupling can change between the models, but that doesn't change the nature of, of the solution. Again, this is, this is very well studied, the system in different, different implementation. Sometimes it has comes with the name of Ginsburg Landau, Stuart Landau, Andronov Hopf, uh, etc. Depending on the function that you take, and depending which function is, is naturally implemented by the system of the oscillators, you can solve different problems. So you've seen these two examples, but it doesn't end there. You can use different different functional dependencies, and then you'll minimize the different functional. All of those, with the ramping up, the game uses mode selection, selection, so loss minimization to find ideally ground state, but at least low energy states. And then you have these time-dependent parameters that you can anneal so that you actually achieve bifurcation that leads to the global minimization. Therefore, the main conclusion is that success in building and implementing this idea is how well you can control and anneal the parameters. So in other words, this function, the coupling, determines which problem you solve, and then you need to find an optimal way to anneal these parameters from below to achieve a good quality solution. And so this is my summary slide. So these are four ingredients that these machines have acquired. They based on wave coherence, synchronization, so that the answer to your problem becomes really the relative phases of the oscillators. It uses mode selection. That's the mechanism that actually allows you to approach the, uh, the energy landscape of the problem that you're solving from below. The bifurcation, either from vacuum, from zero state, or at the threshold, really the key, key mechanism for finding the solution at this critical point, and then amplitude-dependent variant losses help you to avoid being stuck at the local, uh, at the local minimum. And with that, my last slide, we at the very interesting point of our uh, of our lives, perhaps because. All these different themes from all these different directions come in the, same, in the same direction. So the big task is to be actually able to solve hard problems. So this is the schematic diagram. Let's suppose that we have a problem that has now two parameters. And then it's known that we have this easy, hard, easy transition. So for the majority of the types of the problem, perhaps the problem is easy. And then the exhaustive search or some simple, um, simple algorithms help, help, can help you to find a solution. But there is this narrow area in your parameter where the problems are truly hard. And then some can be solved by the smart heuristic. Some 
require some purpose-made algorithms. But some, and that's where we call this serialized, you know, this unconventional computing, but some can be solved by, by this optics or liquid light or, or, or the light. And you think it's kind of tiny, tiny goal, but actually that's where the hardest problems lie, and that's what we really would like to, to solve. And then what we need to, to be able, what we need to be able to, uh, what do we need to achieve to be able to achieve this goal? is we need to think of the statistical mechanics of spin glasses because that tells us the structure of solution space. We need to know where the space transition is and then look specifically at where these hard problems can be found. A lot of elements depend on excitations and dynamics of these systems and different topological defects that do not allow us to actually find the global state but instead get lost stuff at the local minimum. There is a lot of interesting ideas coming from the quantum inspired algorithms and quantum simulators. We need to understand where the optical mapping is, understand the hardness, so that's where complexity theory is important. Of course, the biggest part is actually building the physical system to control it and design it in such a way that you can achieve long-range controllable interactions. It has to be scalable. It has to be energy efficient. It has to have very clear, clear implementation of, uh, of, of finding the ground state and very clear physical idea of why the system actually finds the, the ground state. So we just at the beginning of this path, but because this is such an interdisciplinary research and so many ideas just crossbreed within uh, this big, uh, big task of actually solving something that no one was able to solve before, then I think, you know, something quite, quite remarkable will come out. So with that, I think I spoke for exactly one hour. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, so let, let's just take yeah. take some time for questions, uh, even if we have long break, so don't hesitate if you have any questions in the audience, and please repeat the questions. Somebody should break ice. Yeah, yes. So, uh, hopefully I'll say correctly that with this question model, if you have to actually make a favor of it, uh, and in the actual landscape. Did again, sorry. Uh, I'll feel said correctly that with the ice model, we can essentially just make a tailor made uh, energy potential landscape. I'm wondering, are there any other models that can choose? Why do we focus on the ice model specifically? Uh, if I understood the question correctly, sorry, it's acoustic is not very good here because. It's kind of yeah, what is special uh, about the ice model, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that, oh, what's what's the other... Okay, yeah. No, that's a very good question. So, uh, the Ising model, the Ising Hamiltonian, is universal, which means exactly that. So, given any problem, any combinatorial problem, or any real life problem, I know that I can map this problem into the Ising model with just polynomial overhead, so just polynomial increase on the number of additional variables. And this is very powerful if you think about it. So, for instance, um, I don't know which example to give. I, I like the problem of M twins, right? If, if you, any of you play chess, right? This is the very old problem, it's 150 years old. Given a board, uh, N by N, is there a way to put M twins in non attacking positions? And queens attack in row if they placed in the same row, diagonal, or column. And there are enormous number. I mean, usually the number is P sharp complete problem. So the number of solutions grows with M. Okay? But now if I reformulate it and I start blocking some diagonals on my board, and I'll say, okay, I can't play, I can't place any queens in this diagonal, in that diagonal, in that diagonal. Is there a solution? Can I still place M queens? So it turns out that the hardest problems will appear when I block about n diagonals. So n by n, I blocked n diagonals, and now I ask the question, how is it possible to put n queens in non-attacking position? So this is a famous NP complete problem. So the hardest problem in NP, in NP class. So it takes exponential amount of resources to, to solve this problem. 
So there is a recent paper that only could go, I mean, just guess how difficult this problem is. What would be N, the, the largest N that classical computer cannot deal with? Just checking your intuition, just any guess. So again, the problem is clear. N by N board, I block to at random N diagonals. Can I place N queens in non-attacking position? And then I give classical computer to solve this problem and it cannot do starting with what N? The order. 13. Very good. I you know, usually, I know. usually people say thousands, you know, 10,000. You think, you know, classical computer, they're so powerful, they can do everything, right? So it starts with 21. So N equal 21 is the last time when you can solve this problem. That's it. That's what exponential growth does to you, right? Natasha, in the spirit of the school, can, can we sort of comment on the question that we know the Ising model uh, can be used to be connected with any combinatorial, but we don't know. Uh, ah, yes, how the that's model. What so if somebody will prove for some other model right, that all combinatorial of problems can be connected, that would be next breakthrough. So uh, would it be no, your list? No, no, but I, I didn't finish. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Because I didn't connect it with Isaac, so I started talking about it. Okay. But n queens, if you think about it, it's very easy to formulate as the Isaac minimization of the Isaac model. I simply try to assign zero or one, which is the same. I mean binary, right? Zero one to the board, uh, to the to, to the square. So I put one. If I have queen there, I put zero. If I don't, and then it's just I formulate the Isaac Hamiltonian as penalty on having two ones in one diagonal, two ones or more than two. Uh, more than one in the same row, the same column. So it's very easy to formulate. So this mapping is very easy and it's done for huge variety of um, of this NP complete NP hard problems. So there is a whole whole zoo of you know how you do it and how you do it. We don't know for many problems how to do it in optimal way. Even for the N queens, it's a good problem to mention because the number of spins that I will require for N queens would be N squared. So it's a polynomial growth in a number of variables, right? It's it's modest, but still, with 21, you have 400, uh, slightly more than 400 uh, squares. I can't do because it's just exhaust becomes exhaustive search. It grows exponentially fast. Modern computers cannot do with that. So, in other words, we know for the large majority of combinatorial problems how to map them into the Isaac Hamiltonian. If we build a machine that is capable of finding the global minimum of the Isaac Hamiltonian, therefore we solve these combinatorial problems and we solve them fast. Yeah, so that's. And also, I mean, this is. So the universality means that it's not just the ground state that is actually, actually I can represent. I can also represent excited state. So even in the limited resources, if I simply would like to find a good solution, I don't really need, uh, need the, the global minimum. That, that's what the solvers should be very good about it. And if you think about it also, that may sound as an abstract uh, problem and wins. But if you place Starlink, if you place the satellites, you want to place them so that there is no interference between satellites. So n twin problems comes and pops out from all the difference in different disguises in all these different varieties in many technological areas. So there is a huge number of problems that actually would benefit tremendously if we were able to find the minimum of the Eisen Hamiltonian. There was a quick short question. Uh, yeah, I was wondering how you deal with uh, noise in the weights. So if your mapping is not perfect, but the JLI. That's that's a very good question. Yes, that's uh, we need to uh, in experimentally, you have noise pretty much everywhere. You read out the phases, you uh, introduce the, 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 the weights, you always introduce the, mis uh, the, the errors. And this is the big question, how these errors should go into to influence your, your solution. And again, we, at this moment, we just go, okay, we're close enough, hopefully we have a solution which is close enough to what we want, just good enough. Because again, this whole concept of we are not solving it exactly, right? What we would like, and actually D-Wave, this famous, you know, Canadian company, you know, quantum simulator that, you know, also actually minimizes the Ising Hamiltonian. 
uh, they quickly moved from the idea of, okay, we'll solve this problem faster than the classical computer ever is, is going to, to do. They quickly moved to now a different line because they were so heavily criticized for overselling their, their machine. So they moved, they said, okay, we understand now that if you have a room filled with mathematicians and physicists and you can trap them in that room for one month, and given the problem, they will find a very good uh, solver that solves this problem, the optimal problem. But if you don't have an access to the room filled with mathematicians and physicists, and you cannot um, hold them there for one month, then you can come to us with your problem, and we quickly give you the solution, which may not be the, the, the most optimal one, but good enough for the resources and for the time time you have. So in this context, you know, yes, I know I'm never going, probably never going to introduce super accurate weights. Um, maybe I'm, you know, making the mistakes in reading out of the phases. But if I'm close enough, I can hopefully, hopefully get the, the solution good enough for you, you know, for the time and the constraints and, uh, and uh, so that's not a very good answer, but yes. But that's a good, I mean, this is, of course, the holy grail of the whole thing, how the noise and how the problems, how the errors propagate, um, what effect do they have on your, on your solution? Yeah. So we're, we're looking into that. Okay, I suggest we close the, the talk on this. Thank you very much. For <laughs> and we'll, we'll continue with uh, Roberta Tanvigli from the University of the Ballet and Cystic, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay, let me. Uh, up. Oh, it's Okay, so the floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning uh, again. <laughs> I will start up, uh, today we present uh, uh, recent work we did with quantum reservoir computing and in particular, I will focus on uh, results that are related only to possibility of doing quantum reservoir computing with three screens. And uh, not mention other results, it's just an hour. Actually. So, as uh, typically at the end you run, <laughs> I prefer to introduce the collaborator at the beginning. So this work was realized mainly by postdoc uh, Johannes Nokala, the design to the university, uh, PhD students, Jorge is here, Rodrigo, and two collaborators at the FIS that are Gianluca and Miguel, that maybe some of you uh, know particularly Miguel, that has been working in classical research for a long time. So we start actually from the same point of uh, Natalia, <laughs> that is uh, just put ourselves into the context. So you can actually have uh, machine learning to do photonics, in which you use different methods of machine learning for different photonic applications, or you can do machine learning with photonics. And uh, here I just put uh, this uh, two, uh, recent review if you want to go into in more depth into this subject. Uh, interestingly, also in the context of machine learning, there has been the same double approach. So when you speak about quantum machine learning, uh, there are several words that mean with quantum machine learning, the machine learning that you do just also using classical means uh, for a quantum task. So you have a hard quantum problem and you assist the solution of the problem with classical means. On the other hand, you can do quantum machine learning with quantum substrate, or even only inspired by quantum substrates. And here I put some examples also in this, in this context. So what I'm going to do today uh, is uh, start again from the possibility of doing machine learning and the photonic machine learning uh, with photonics and with uh, quantum systems using them as substrate. But I will move into different directions. So before we have seen a problem of optimization, and now I will speak about time series processing and reservoir computing. 
So before I will introduce a little bit reserve computing and quantum reserve computing, and then I will focus on this platform I would like to, to tell you about today. So what is reserve computing? Reserve computing is a, a supervised machine learning method uh, in which uh, typically you try uh, to solve uh, uh, tasks that are related to time series process. And uh, the good performance of a system to be a reserve computing, so to process this temporal task, are uh, typically related to the high dimensionality of the system you use for this uh, purpose, its internal memory and non-linearity. So this uh, idea of uh, reserve computing has been uh, around in the last 20 years. So these uh, eco-state network, I'm not sure I'm told enough, these eco-state network and liquid state machine are the first references that were dealing with architecture that are similar to the one we're going to speak about. And uh, here you can find some, so this is the pedagogic part is to provide references. So here you have a chapter in which reserve computing is introduced. Also in uh, this book that is specifically on photonic reserve computing, there is, a, there is a chapter and there is this actually fully devoted uh, book on general reserve computing and many, and many application out. So typically in reserve computing, you have three layers. You have an input that can be your temporal series, you have a substrate, and then you do the training to do some tasks. So let's start from the input. As I was telling, typically in this context, uh, the input, uh, okay, no animation doesn't matter. Uh, the input is a temporal sequence, okay? And uh, the, the meaning of a temporal sequence is uh, that uh, you are receiving data in time and you want to process this data online. So when you are receiving the data. Okay, so example of this kind of task that are temporal tasks are speech around with recognition, uh, forecasting of temporal series uh, and uh, application in signal communication and so on. So the important thing is that uh, you, you need to be able to process this data as long as they arrive. Uh, without using uh, um, storing, external storing of this uh, temporal data. As for the substrate, again, of course, you can do uh, this kind of task using, as usual, the, the prominent example uh, of compu the prominent computing strategy, this digital computing. But actually, you can uh, uh, even more favorably uh, try to realize this task with recurrent neural networks and actually, in physical reserve computing, it is interesting to know that there are a large variety of systems that you can do for, doing, for performing reserve computing. And here are just uh, some, uh, some examples, including a bucket of water and uh, the area of an octopus. <laughs> so you, you can have actually a large variety of systems that you use as a substrate for your uh, reserve computing. Um, the substrate, it's typically a dynamical system. So you have that at each time, you have an input injection, so the time here is k. So you are injecting the signal at each time. The reserve computing is dynamically evolving as some function of the input as k and the previous state of the system. Okay? Now, this is particularly suitable for time series, but of course, the this, this same approach can be used also for static tasks. In this case, you still again uh, need to process the input, but uh, you do not uh, need uh, to have memory into your system. And this approach is known as extreme learning machine. For instance, when you do classification or non-temporal tasks. What about the, the training? So you have some tasks you want to perform, you need to have your system, you need to train it. The nice thing about the approach of the cyber computing is that training is just restricted to the output layer. Okay? So you have some observable that you decide to monitor. This would be X out. And then you have uh, some function that you need to perform to, of this function to get your, your task done. But in order to be able to perform this task, optimize your problem to do this task, you just need to do a linear regression, for instance, on this, uh, on this output layer. So this is a great simplification in the, in the training with respect, for instance, to generic neural network methods in which we need to use back propagation through, uh, through time. So this is uh, one of the mainly recognized advantages of uh, reserved computing. 
And uh, we can summarize here in reserve computing at the end the main ingredients typically mentioned for the goodness of this approach are the fast training, uh, you just do some regression at the output layer. The fact that they can be multitasking because you can have the same physical systems and we are not touching the physical system during the training and during the optimization and just changing the optimization at the output layer, you can do different tasks. And uh, it can be uh, also interesting for a physicist, it can be implemented in different physical systems and then you can learn again, as Natalia was saying, which are the physical features of the physical systems that makes this system good for doing reserve computing, okay? So it has been successful in many applications and here I just cite, definitely not a comprehensive list, but just to give some example in uh, forecasting with memory store or uh, high speed uh, photonic computing for uh, um, words uh, recognition or vowel recognition, uh, recognition of actions and, uh, and so far and so on. So it's, uh, it has been proven in different, in different platform and uh, just in the last uh, three, four years, people started to say, okay, can we actually implement these reserve computing concepts in quantum system? And of course, if you go to a quantum, in quantum system, and if you go to a quantum system, what do we gain? I mean, which is the, which is the relevance in going, in going there? So the first paper in this context was this one by Fuji and Nakajima, uh, published in 2017, in which what they were considering was uh, a transverse physics model, so a quantum uh, model of coupled qubits in a random network that were used to process a temporal, a classical temporal signal that was injected in some way into the system. We will say later how. So, which were the which are the reason to move into that? Why should we go to a quantum system to do um, reserve computing? There are a number of uh, of uh, things that one can uh, think about. One is the fact that you have, uh, um, you need uh, large uh, numbers of degrees of freedoms in order to be able to, well, to, uh, to obtain a well performance of reserve computing. And in a quantum system, you can actually have the Hilbert uh, space uh, with the exponential, with the exponential size. And this is of course one of the main uh, opportunity that have been seen in the context of reserve computing as one of the main motivations to go into quantum reserve computing. So this is one. Another thing that you can mention is that nowadays uh, quantum computers are noisy. So we are in what is called as uh, the noisy intermediate scale, not still so huge, quantum devices. And in these MISC devices, it is actually um, an opportunity to, to realize uh, uh, these uh, devices can be an opportunity to realize reserve computing because, as I was saying, it is not so important to finely tune the physical substrate. So, this can be an opportunity to use this kind of noisy, uh, noisy devices. The advantage then uh, the one want to see if, there's, if, is, uh, if there is any uh, possibility of having improved performance due to the presence of quantum coherences. And then, of course, it can be also interesting in both directions. Uh, it can uh, provide a new focus also to study quantum system and one can define and identify new dynamical regimes in these systems. So uh, we, we provided recently an overview of the first movement in the direction. There have been several works in these, uh, in these references, in these reference there. So again, uh, in uh, quantum machine learning, uh, as I was telling at the beginning, you can have, uh, uh, this is a, quite well-known CQ diagram in which you speak about the fact that you can have the algorithm that can be classical or quantum or the type of data that you are analyzing that can be classical or quantum. And then you can identify different situations with this kind of classification. So say in reserve computing, you can do something similar. And here maybe we can speak about three ingredients to be a little bit more precise. Uh, one of the input, so you can have a temporal series that can be classical or quantum. The other is the substrate, okay, the, the system, the physical system that you are using can be classical or quantum, classical or quantum regime operating. And uh, finally, you have the, the task that you are performing that can be also classical or quantum, and then you can devise a whole uh, scenario of uh, situations. 
And uh, in particular, for instance, the first one of Nakajima I was mentioning before, these were classical data done on a quantum easy model, CQ, and see because the tasks they were doing were actually classical tasks, tasks like to see if there was a linear memory into the system and so on. So what about the substrates that have been proposed so far? As I was telling, the subject is recent, but there have been actually several proposals in this context. So there have been proposals of using nuclear magnetic resonance, um, uh, atomic system like trapped ions, feminine bosons in Latin, super in qubits, circuits, and, uh, and photonic uh, platforms. And um, I, I, there is no time to go through all these results, but I would like to just highlight a couple of them. Uh, one is uh, what would be the first demonstration in an ISC device device of this, uh, of this quantum reserve computing that for the moment has not been still completely settled experimentally. Actually, it's not only slow for the moment in this experiment there, for instance. And in that case, it was on the, so in the BBMQ platform, it was a channel in Yamamoto. Yamamoto were presenting these first results about reserve computing. Then there has been a second work that was a long time in the archive and now is in this book chapter. But this is what uh, actually realized with the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, but it's not a temporal task. It's ju they just showed static tasks, so it would be a string learning machine, as I was mentioning before. And I would say that these are the, probably the only two things that are in the direction of experimental demonstration for the moment. So about uh, the, the task the classification, I just uh, add also a couple of words because there has been a lot of creat creativity also in this context. For a classical task, for instance, you have a temporal series, an example of a simple example of a ta classical task that allow you to see how, uh, how long is the memory that you can actually have in your system is this timer task. In the timer task, you have the, the input, here is the gray line, at some point is changing in time, okay? And then you want to see if your system is able to remember that change in time that was happening some time steps before. So the target would be, for instance, here, at the distance of a certain delay, to be able, if you are able to see that there was a spike there. And here the target is the, gray line, the black line, continuous, and you can see the ability of a system, a quantum system in this case, to be able to, to do the same, uh, uh, to perform this task in, with the dots. Okay, so this is an example of a task. This would have a memory and this would have uh, delay five and this was delay 20, so six probably, but uh, just to, to give a, me a measure of the memory that uh, a, a system can have. So this is a classical task. You have a classical input and you just want to see when the, the input was changing in time. Then you can have quantum tasks. So you can have inputs that are, for instance, three states, entangled states. And then you want to be able really to address with your quantum system these states and to recover some of the property, quantum properties of this. This is an example of a static task, uh, like uh, the classification of squid uh, states. Uh, but there have been many proposals in the literature, uh, like entanglement detection, quantum state tomography, the possibility to prepare quantum states. Uh, the use of uh, the cell computing in, uh, in quantum state measurement. Uh, and uh, here, uh, they, they change the title in the final version. This is uh, about creating circuits with different gates uh, using the approach of reserve computing. Okay, so these are examples of classical and really more quantum tasks. Okay, I will move now to the, to the core after this uh, brief introduction. And this is a good moment to ask if you have any question uh, about reserve computing. Of course, it was a fast introduction, but I want just you to have uh, the idea that this is an approach in which a dynamical system is used to perform tasks that are related to the data that you are sequentially receiving in time and that you want to process. Okay, so this is the main framework. And now we will go into a specific realization of quantum reserve computing. And I will start uh, focusing on the results that we, that what we have shown in this work, that was the possibility of using a network of linearly coupled uh, optical modes. I mean, the software of course need to be non-linear to, to have the even linear coupling. But the dynamics that we are using is a linear dynamics of this uh, optical modes, and to see that actually this is enough 
to obtain a good approach to quantum reserve computing. So how is this model described? The substrate is just a Hamiltonian that is quadratic. So you have the typical coupled harmonic oscillators in Hamiltonian. Okay, so these are quantum oscillators. You have some random coupling within there, so it's not a uniform uh, object. It's, uh, it's exact topology we have found that is not uh, a main ingredient in this uh, context, uh, but typically it's taken random, and all the results that I will show are typically taken doing an average with a different realization to see, let's say, a representative, a representative random. Um, a representative performance of these random systems. Okay, and then we will consider Gaussian quantum states. So, as for the substrate of the system, of course, uh, coupled uh, uh, in the time you can uh, see in many, uh, in many contexts, but I will mention just a couple of them. So, one is this uh, possibility of having these superconducting coplanar wave guides in which you can actually create uh, some kind of uh, network here, for instance, this was uh, uh, this, uh, um, what are the 13 uh, modes, a uh, network, hyperbolic network that was uh, realized as reported in this, uh, in this work. And, uh, and uh, another example of, uh, of a platform in which can, uh, we, we can actually realize this kind of quadratic Hamiltonian are photonic platforms, and the one that are going to be also discussed in after the coffee break. So we just say a few words. And in this case, what you have is that uh, a frequency comb, um, a multimode um, light beam is interacting with a quadratic crystal, and then this is giving rise to the form of the Hamiltonian that was giving you before. So you have actually these modes that are coupling. So just to make sense of the sentence I was making before, the final dynamics we are considering is a quadratic Hamiltonian, so a linear dynamics. But of course, what you need to produce this uh, interaction between the optical modes is always, again, matter. And in this case, for instance, would be a quadratic crystal in which you have the typical parametric down conversion process and then you have these coupling that are introduced. Okay, so our system is a quantum, and it is um, also simple. It's an harmonic simple. Can we still be able to do uh, quantum reserve computing in an efficient way? Uh, what we actually found uh, is that in analogy to what was also shown uh, several years ago in classical reserve computing, uh, there, are, um, there are aspects in the server computing that can, uh, there are uh, parts of the server computing architecture that can help you introducing the nonlinearity that you need. And uh, you do not need to have the nonlinearity necessarily in the server dynamics. And what we, what we found is that uh, the way in which you inject the information into the system is a key point here that allows you to have uh, different performances. So in the classical work, the one that I mentioned above, uh, they were introducing the linearity with the detection. So there was this photo detection, so it was a square of the field, and this was enough to introduce the linearity. Here instead, uh, we are considering different input injections. So we will consider coherent states, squeezed states, and thermal states. And in each of these cases, what we will do is that we will have our networks of modes. And when we want to inject information into the system, we will actually set the state of one of the oscillator at each time in one of these states. And then the input is encoded in one of the parameters that is defined in these states. For instance, in the simplest case, if you have a coherent state, then you can encode the input in the amplitude, OK? Or you can encode the amplitude in the, in the phase. If you have a, an optical field, then we have uh, both the amplitude and the phase. So these are two ways that you can use to encode the input as written there. OK, SK, remember, was the input. So the amplitude, this would be an example of an amplitude that I'm encoding, so linear in the input. And the other one is in the phase. Or you can use squeezing. And in this case, again, you can use uh, the encoding in the strength of the squeezing 
or in this freezing angle. And in thermal states, you can well, only one degree of freedom, so you could just use that one that is put the input encoding in the variance related to the temperature. Okay? Uh, is there any of you that is not familiar with squeeze states? So these are the pedagogical conditions. Should I remind what are squeeze states? Yes. yes, should I? Okay, thank you for answering. <laughs> uh, so, squeeze states are states of flight in which the fluctuations in one of the uh, directions, for instance, you have, in, you have an optical field, so you can have the real and imaginary parts of the field. So, you can actually define these states in a complex plane. And uh, typically, in this quantum state, you have the product of the two variances is limited by the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty relations, okay? Because these two quantities do not commute. So a squeeze state is a state in which one of the two variances is actually going below this short noise level, that is this classical reference level. Of course, Heisenberg is not violated, so in the conjugate variable, you will have uh, more noise than, than the short noise one predicts. Mathematically, uh, the, the squeezing is produced by a squeezing operator like this one, in which you have this A squared and the conjugate one, acting on your vacuum state. So and the action of an operator like this creates squeeze vacuum. So you start from vacuum with the same fluctuation and really in the imaginary part, and any physical Hamiltonian that is able to produce an effect similar to this one will be able to produce squeeze vacuum. And actually, uh, there are, for instance, uh, chi 2 crystal, quadratic crystal are an example, the, one of the most, uh, the most sad example in which you can actually produce this kind of squeezing. These are the first references. Squeezing has been experimentally proven from the 80 in, uh, in uh, third order and second order uh, media, nonlinear media. And when you have this squeeze vacuum, you have the, the variance, for instance, you can have this squeezing in different quadratures. So to, to example, a quadrature I was telling on the real and imaginary part of the, of the field, but you can actually have any direction in the complex plane would produce other quadratures. And the quadrature angle squeezing, uh, if we set it to zero, will be, for instance, uh, with this uh, parameterization, a reduction, exponential reduction of the fluctuation in one of the quadrature with respect to an exponential amplification of the fluctuation in the other one. Okay, so this is just basic stuff, but just to remind, what do we say when we say that we are using squeeze vacuum? In this setup, it means that we are using fluctuations of vacuum with some preferred direction for the distribution of the fluctuations. And then we are using this direction as the direction in which you can actually encode uh, uh, your input. So what about the map? You need to define a way in which you inject your information into the system and then the system needs to evolve. So physically, the, the system we are considering here is uh, evolving with the same structure of the first map proposed by Nakajima for the easy model. Okay? The map is as follows. We have an input, the input is written into an ancilla state, as I was mentioning before, for instance, in the squeezing angle of the squeeze states. And then this ancilla state is coupled with the other mode of the network, and this coupling is created by the nonlinearity in the quadratic crystal, for instance, so these modes start to interact with each other. Then at the output layer, typically in quantum system, you use expectation values of some observables. This would be the output layer that you process and that you train. And then at this level, you can recover uh, your, um, uh, you can try to perform your task and, uh, and see which is the performance. So mathematically, the same, just the same. The Hamiltonian of the reservoir is written like that. P and Q are two position and momentum quadrature, or real and imaginary part of the intensity quadrature. It's equivalent apart from scaling factors, and of course, you have to be very careful to take into account. And then you have uh, your nodes. How many nodes? Let's suppose you have n nodes. They interact with each other. Okay? So this would be the Hamiltonian. The Laplacian matrix is L is the one that is encoding all these random coupling into our systems. Okay? And then here is the, the good thing. The choice of a simple system is because first you want to learn which are really the, the physical features that are that are useful in a setting in which you can do something also analytical. 
analytically. And here, actually, you can use the synthetic formalism and calculate what is going on into the system and to get some, uh, some more immediate results. And here what you have is that you couple the reservoir nodes with ancillary nodes. So if you suppose that at some point they are decoupled because you have just written your state on the, on the ancilla, then they couple through dynamics, and the dynamics is described by this S matrix. There is no point in the by this X matrix, okay? Yeah. By this, no, you don't see, you don't see the course. By this S matrix. And then uh, the blocks of this synthetic matrix allow you to uh, actually calculate the world dynamics, and then you can calculate the first order expectation values or the covariance. So the covariance is, is just the matrix of all the coupled variances and correlation of, the, of your problem, okay? So this is the mathematical structure, and uh, the output layer in this case is then given or by the first order or by the second order moments or covariances. What do you find? You find that actually you have a quite a good performance uh, with this, and it actually saturates uh, some, some indicators also in, uh, in this sense. So starting from, uh, for instance, simple tasks, you have that in the, in, you can have example in which you see how a reservoir that is working only with squeezed vacuum is able to display memory, as in this time delay task or timer task, or it is able to um, anticipate which should be the dynamics of a temporal series that you are receiving. And this is an example of prediction task known as a Santa Fe, Santa Fe task. Okay, so these, uh, these are examples of tasks that you can do, but you see that uh, typically in these kind of problems you have uh, uh, performance dependent task every time. So it is, uh, it is nice, it was introduced uh, actually already 10 years ago, this indicator that is called the information processing capacity. And this is an indicator that attempts to give the, a general information about a linear and nonlinear memory that you can have in your, in your system. Okay, and it addresses this, uh, this capacity, this memory in your system, doing the task of reproducing polynomial of input sequences that are mixing also different delay times. So for instance, this would be an example of a target. You see you have a linear cubic term in which you have the quadratic contribution at one delay and the linear contribution multiplied by them at a different delay. So this is just an example to show the, the kind of polynomial typically you use a set of uh, orthogonal polynomials like the genre polynomials. And then you can see the ability of your system to reproduce this kind of polynomial at different delay gives you a general framework to see the processing capacity of your system. Now, why is this indicator interesting? Because this indicator saturates to a maximum level. It can be shown uh, that uh, it is bounded by the number of linearly independent observables in the output. So if your output layer, for instance, you are measuring the first order moments of your N oscillators, here you have position and momentum, so you will have two N elements at the output layer. This means that also this information processing capacity will be to a maximum, okay? So this is good, because then you have, you can see how near you are going to, to a maximum volume. So we'll use this information processing capacity. And now I ask the following questions. Uh, let's suppose that you do your encoding. You can encode, as I was telling, in the amplitude of the states or in the angle. Okay, and what I did here was introducing a parameter just to go from one case to the other. So when lambda is equal to zero here, so this is lambda going between zero and one as in the equation in the first line. When lambda is equal to zero, you are just encoding in the amplitude. And when lambda is equal to one, you are just encoding in the phase. So what do I see? If I encode only in the amplitude, I have only linear contribution. So in this information processing capacity, I have linear and nonlinear contributions, and I can actually look also the degree of the nonlinearity, okay? If I encode in this way, I see, in the case in which I encode only in the amplitude, I only have, I only have linear memory. Then I start to see nonlinearity being things up, and in the case in which I encode poorly, oh, thank you, in the phase, 
In the case in which I encode in, uh, in the phase, I actually have nonlinear uh, memory. So even if the dynamics is linear, because the modes are linearly coupled, in this case, the output is also linear, because here we have considered the first order moments at the output, so just the average uh, quadratures. Still, we can develop nonlinearity just through the encoding, OK? And here we do some comparison, because I told you, we can do this uh, encoding in different ways. So in the first column, we actually have a classical system. So this is an eco-state network that is uh, one of the successful implementation of residual computing that was introduced already uh, 20 years ago. And I consider an eco-state network with eight oscillators. OK? And I see some performance. So this is the capacity. I have an eight oscillator, and I have the maximum capacity that is eight. If I use the coherent state in amplitude, it's almost the same. It's just twice because I have position and momentum. But it's more or less the same. Here I'm using the encoding in the amplitude. And I'm measuring at the output just the first order moment. OK? So I reach the same capacity. I have the same number of the factor two of degrees of freedom. If instead I go to thermal states or squeeze vacuum and I look at the covariance matrix, how many elements do we have now? So if I had n oscillators, it would be something proportional to, I have a square matrix now that is n by n. So the elements are n and plus one divided by two. So something like n square order, okay? And here I actually had a larger capacity due to this. And in particular, in the case of squeeze vacuum, if I use just the amplitude of squeezing, so how strong the effect of squeezing here, I have this uh, linear and nonlinear contribution, but if I use the angle, of course, you have uh, the, the, the phase uh, is introducing the corresponding nonlinearity in a more evident and striking way, and then I have more, more nonlinearity. So what is shown here is the possibility, apart from the nice colors, of having uh, reservoir computing realized just with quantum fluctuations here. So the, the reservoir itself is not in, in an intense light. The average intensity of the reservoir is zero, but there is some squeezing, OK? And the squeezing is used to perform the task, and we can perform it quite well, both in linear and nonlinear uh, performance. Just uh, to mention the quantum advantage here would be the fact that as we have this stochastic field and that you are using the second order moments, then you have this polynomial increase of the capacity because now you have n square degrees of freedom, OK? This is limited because we just have Gaussian states, and then the Hilbert space is fully determined by the first and second order moment. So are you familiar with Gaussian states? I mean, you are familiar with Gaussian statistics. So with Gaussian statistics, you know that all higher order moments will be just function of first and second order moments, OK? is a simple statistics just determined by the parameters of the Gaussian distribution. And then you just have this quadratic um, improvement, OK? But of course, you can go somewhere else, and then you will have large improvement. This is just to show the potential of, uh, of the scene. So I focused on this part of the results of this work that was showing that the reservoir with this quantum fluctuation can be versatile, because you can have, uh, what does it mean, versatile? that you can have different forms of nonlinearity and you can do different tasks with the different performance just by changing the way in which you are injecting your input into the system and injecting the input into the system and remind is just setting the state of one oscillator in one way or in the other. Okay? Uh, I didn't discuss here, but it can also be shown that this is also a universal um, architecture for reserve computing. OK, so you can use these Gaussian states, even in spite of all the nonlinearity of, of the linearity of the model, uh, still due to the nonlinearity in the input that is important to the, the object of the nonlinearity when you speak about this, and this is, will be universal. So if you are interested in seeing how quantum mechanics that is linear, moreover, with the quadratic Hamiltonian that is also linear dynamics, is able to produce this kind of nonlinearity, you can find some uh, analytical results in this, uh, 
in this reference. And actually, in that work, we, we discuss both cases. The case of this uh, continuous variable uh, reserved computing, but also the case of uh, qubits, uh, using couple qubits, okay? But uh, too much stuff, so I'm just focusing a few ideas and hope that I can convey the message of this. Now, this was very nice because uh, I told that uh, I saturate the maximum performance, so here, I don't show the normalized, but I tell you that these are the maximum values of the information processing capacity that you can reach with this platform. But everything is ideal. And then one can wonder, okay, if I go beyond the ideal and I really monitor the quantum systems and I take into account all these uh, quantum measurements and so on, do I still get these fantastic ideal performances? Are they robust if I go into the lab and try to do the, the experiment? And, and that really is not a trivial, uh, trivial point and, uh, and need to be addressed. And these are the results of this uh, work uh, by Jorge that we probably present the poster, you have it, no? And uh, so you can also ask more about this uh, to him. So, the last part of the talk, you still have strands before the coffee break. So the last part of the talk will be this uh, uh, going beyond this ideal quantum reserve computing. In the ideal quantum reserve computing, we're just considering a system. You have an Hamiltonian. You set your input state perfectly, and miraculously, you achieve uh, this performance uh, looking just at the variances, like if the covariance matrix is uh, something that you can, you, you can exactly measure in your experiments with finite resources. Uh, where and why should quantum measurement be an issue? So there are at least a couple of aspects that should raise some concern in this context. One is the fact that uh, in order to extract this covariance matrix, you have this quantum system, so you need to have copies of the system, you need to have the ensemble. So the expectation value is an average over an ensemble. So when you do this ensemble, um, you can do it in different ways. You can do sequentially. Uh, in this case, you will need to do the experiment, then you do the experiment again, you do the experiment again, and then you take the expectation value as the average over this uh, large ensemble. This uh, for online processing is not really good because you have your temporal sequences arrive and then you stop and you start again because I need to do several copies of it to have my ensemble. The other thing is to do it in parallel. You see, photonics, one of the advantages is the possibility of going in, into parallel uh, approaches, and then you will need to have or, several realization of your uh, ensemble, and we will see how you, you can do it. The second problem that you can have is that the measurement itself is really not uh, helping the ability of your system to have a memory. So when I was showing the dynamics before, I was telling you have the dynamics of your system and at each time you inject the input, you have a memory into the system of the previous inputs and of the previous states. But if you measure it, after the measurement, if you fully measure it, after the measurement, everything will be lost. After each measurement, we just collapse the state and we will have just that. And then we start again and the new input, no memory will be retained. So this is the second problem and we can see a different way to, to solve it, okay? So the problem of the ratio of memory. So the two questions we want to ask, uh, want to answer, <laughs> already ask is, is it possible to perform sequential time series and extract information, including the quantum measurement online, and uh, uh, without using an ensemble of platform here I mean, without using these things of repeating the experiments again or without having a cumbersome very large number of replica of the whole uh, apparatus, okay? So one question is, is this, and the other is, uh, can we obtain uh, the same performance that we were pre predicting ideally when we go really uh, introduces the quantum measurement? So we ask this question in two ways, and today we speak only about one, but I hear almost the whole event, so you can uh, catch up with, you, with me when you, when you like, and I will uh, discuss with you the second. So today we speak about the first one, the, the one that is uh, more immediately related to uh, photonic implementation. And in, the, in this one, we have proposed a system in which you actually use several pulses 
to do your ensemble, and now I will show you in detail how. And in the second one, instead, we consider the qubits uh, easing model, and then in that case, uh, we see what you can do using weak measurements, that are measurements that are less informative about the state of uh, your system, okay, but uh, are also less perturbative. Of course, the two things come, come together, and then we, we can see when this is a useful approach. So let's focus on the first one, that is the photonic approach. So this is the setup that we, that we propose. It's still a theoretical proposal, but at least we try to dig into the, 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 the realistic results that you can get if we include the quantum measurement there. So as I was telling you before, you have your ancilla is the state that you are writing into your system. And here in this case, I consider that the ancilla is, uh, um, is, uh, is given by a pulse. And in particular, I repeat the input several times to do this uh, like parallelization. So I want to have uh, M pulses, and this will be the ensemble. Okay? So I inject M pulses into the system. Part of the light is detected with homodyne detection, and part of the light is transmitted to the beam splitter and circulating, and then of course exiting again, into this, uh, into this, this feedback loop. Okay? So this is the setup. The input, the measurements, and the reserve computing dynamics that is taking place here inside. The ancilla, as I was telling, again, we use as the ancilla the input written in the angle of a free state, for instance. Okay? But then we repeat this input several times in the sense we, we, we consider the case in which the information we are processing is not as fast as our reserver. So the reserver can actually be fast enough to be able to process the input before it changes. Okay? So we repeat the, the ancilla a few times, and then we change the ancilla and we repeat it another few times. So each of these colors represents a different input. Okay? The input entered into the system. Then we have the network, the reserver network. And to create the reserver network, for instance, we have this guy to interaction. And then I have the feedback in which all these, mod, all these uh, pulses are stored into the fiber. And then I have a new input entering again. In each of these pulses, I have n modes. This is the size of the reserve. So here are all the ingredients that, uh, that I need. And uh, in particular, the ensemble is provided by the number of pulses that I repeat here, in which I repeat here the ancilla. The input is written in the squeezing, as I was saying. In each pulse, we have m mode. So uh, what I I represented here as this uh, curve is actually an object that contains, like in the frequency cones, for instance, I mentioned before, you can have se several frequency modes interacting between them. The interaction is provided by some no, nonlinear medium in our case, and uh, the fiber allows you to have some kind of delay before all these ensemble interact again with the next input. Okay, so this is the parallelized uh, photonic way to, to do the things in this, in this proposal. Then I introduce here homodyne detection. With homodyne detection, I measure these uh, first and second order moments of the quadrature of the lights that I want to use. Okay, and then from my set of measurements, I build up the covariance matrix. But uh, I'm not assuming that I have the exact covariance matrix of the problem. I consider that I build up this matrix only from a sample of measurement that is what you have in an experiment. You have M, a sample of M measurement, and then you have some noise in your, in your, um, in your determination, in your prediction. I have done yes. <laughs> you started late. So. Uh, yes, I started late, but uh, I understand that it also for us day, everyone is, is tired. So. I, I, I hope you are still maintaining your attention. And um, so here we have your finite, uh, your, your finite histogram of the covariance mattering at each input you built it. And then you look at the dynamics. And then you have a more realistic uh, uh, estimation of what your system can be able uh, to do. And this is online. Of course, it is online up to the situation in which the data that you are processing are data that are uh, not so fast as your, 
a your, as your device. So you need to have data that are arriving slow enough so you can process in the fiber all these pulses before the next input arrives. Uh, this is a key, a key idea. Okay? So again, you can look at the ideal performance of this device. What would be the ideal performance? The ideal performance is the performance that you get when you use actually an infinite ensemble. So now M, the number of times you repeat your input before to go to the next one, is large enough that you can determine your covariance matrix without error. Okay, this means ideal. Okay, so if I have this ideal scenario, I start from there, then of course I go to the realistic one. If I start to the ideal scenario, uh, we actually find that uh, you can obtain uh, the, the performance you're expecting and also the scaling. This is the important point about the quantum advantage. Let's go just uh, comment what is on the plots. So this would be the linear capacity. So it's the capacity of the system to remember previous inputs up to some delay, okay? So the linear capacity, for instance, of a system with eight oscillators, and for some reflectivity of the beam splitter would be this green dashed line, and then you are able to, you have your system, you are injecting your input, and the system is able to remember which was the input up to 20, let's say, input before. It's storing the information. This is the memory, the, the fading memory is a key feature of reserve computing, okay? So this is the ability of the system to re to maintain all this information inside the reservoir and then to, the, this is an indicator of the amount of memory yields. If you increase the network, so instead of having eight oscillators, now you have 10 oscillators. Now you see how the memory increased. So you go from here to here, you see it's a, it's a significant factor just adding two quantum oscillators. You have a significant factor of uh, ability to remember Far, uh, far um, elements in the series, okay? Now, the fact that you have more memory when you increase the number of oscillator is the, and, and the, the polynomial in this case growth of this memory, is the advantage that is promised by quantum systems. So we are, we are doing well. If we change the reflectivity of the mirror of the beam splitter, so that mirror was a determining how much, light, how much of the light is remaining into the system and suffering feedback and uh, providing more uh, rich dynamics to the receiver and how much is instead uh, leaving and uh, going into the detector without being uh, stored into your feedback loop. So if you increase the reflectivity, you actually find that you are able to maintain the light pulses a longer, longer time and then you can reach, so you go through from dash to one to the other dash to just increasing the reflectivity, you see that you are actually able to attain a longer uh, memory, okay? When we consider these uh, capacities uh, and also the non-linear one, this was just the linear one, with this indicator I told you that is the IPC as before, what we get is actually for up to the number of oscillators we can put in our numerical simulation, we actually have that uh, the performance is saturated. So you have a polynomial growth with the number of oscillators. Here now we have a number of oscillators, so how many, how big is your reservoir, how many oscillators are in each of your pulses. And uh, for a pulse within uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten modes, you see that you maintain the maximum value. This would be the normalized. Okay, and uh, actually in, uh, in this, uh, this is nice because then we also find that this is a good platform to, to do ideal reserve computing. And the other good thing about uh, it, apart the performance, is the fact that this is linear and then you can try to extract some information and not only looking at the results and say, okay, it works. You can really try to dig a little bit into the details and that's where you find that the covariance matrix can be expressed of a sum of terms at different delays, okay? So the contribution at different delays can be actually singled out, and then you can see that the different contribution depends on the reflective, uh, reflection of the beam splitter in this way. So the larger is the, the delay, of course, the smaller are the, this contribution, and then you can, you can use this in, uh, in the later. So for the moment, the message is ideally this 
approach with this fiber and so on is in Scradu works well. What happens if now I go to the non-ideal? What happens non-ideally? Non-ideally, I don't have the exact covariance matter. I infer the covariance matrix only from a number of measurements. And the number of measurements here is set by the size of the sample, m. So I, I do my measurements m times, and then I see with the number of measurements how this increases. So the ideal case would be n equal to infinite, and this was the curve we have seen before. But with a smaller number, uh, with a smaller size of the ensemble, so with just a uh, uh, few elements, you see that actually the capacity of the system drastically decreases. OK? So you really need uh, to have uh, good precision in measuring your covariance. You need to, have, to be able to do a good tomography of your, of your state if you want to be able to have any of this quantum advantage. And it's not everything. It's just lost in the last of, in the lack of resolution that you have when you try to build your output layer. So in this case, of course, there is no polynomial scaling, and I would say no quantum advantage. Okay? Can we do something and just take quantum and <laughs> no, we can do something, of course, if not, I will not speak about this. And uh, the covariance matrix is noisy, but we can elaborate some uh, strategy. So um, the point about the covariance matrix uh, giving problems in uh, producing well performance at far delay in the, in the dynamics is because the last contribution at higher order delays are typically small. And then when you have a finite number of measurements, you can assume that for a large number of measurements, you have some noise that is just the inverse of the square of n. Okay, you have just some Gaussian noise just introduced by the finite size of the, of the measurement, okay? So in, uh, in order to sustain the precision that you have with some measurements, when you want to, um, to, to reach further delays into the past, you need to boost the number of measurements, of course. The more you measure, in the real case, you get the perfect performance. And you can actually predict, as this is linear, you can actually do some uh, something uh, about it, and uh, you can actually see how uh, the number of measurements need to be incremented in order to maintain the precision. And the other thing you can do is, apart from boosting the number of measurements, there is, of course, <laughs> the easiest way. In this system, also, the reflectivity of the mean splitter play a key role. Actually, the memory of this system is controlled by the reflectivity of the beam splitter. And then this is another tuning parameter that you can use. So one can actually find an, an argument, an analytical argument, to say that if you change, so you have a reserve, and now you want to maintain this quantum advantage, so you want to go to a bigger reserve and to have, in this case, a polynomial performance increase. If you want to have this polynomial increase, the strategy you can use is to increase the reflectivity of the beam splitter here in this way, and at the same time to increase the number of measurements. So this is the scaling that we find that you should guarantee that you maintain the ideal performance, so the polynomial scaling. But actually, numerically, in the range that we have been looking, you can actually do something here. Instead of having n to the 8, you have n to the 6, you can actually <laughs> try to contain a little bit the number of measurements, and still, this would be the main result. So this would be the non-ideal. So the ideal one would be the quadratic I was telling at the beginning. The non-ideal one with a finite number of measurements in which I fix a number of measurements, and then I just increase the size of the reserve, is just going in this way. And you see that is largely non-optimal. So you are not able to sustain this quantum advantage. But if you increase the precision of your assessment and you change also the reflectivity of the mean splitter, you can actually recover this polynomial growth. So there is a strategy to do quantum well in two words. Okay? Let's see separately the effects of these two things. So we have seen with constant reflectivity and constant number of measurements, so you fix at the beginning and then you just increase the reserve size, but you don't measure it more. You would have that the normalized capacity decrease, decreases because you are not able to sustain this polynomial growth, so the normalized one is going down. 
If you only change the reflectivity, it doesn't seem that the loan is doing too much. If you boost the number of measurements, it's doing a lot. The two things together work well, and if you tune the things in this way, you can actually sustain the, the capacity. Okay? Okay. Let's uh, take a couple of minutes on these slides, and then we have the coffee lesson and coffee. Okay, last um, slide is about uh, just give you uh, the, the take home message. So, the take home message is that uh, um, even uh, in, uh, so of course, photonic, machine learning photonic, of course, offers great opportunity, and we will see several examples in this, uh, in this uh, school. But in the case of quantum reserve computing, at least this platform showed that even a linear network can be used to do quantum reserve computing, showing an advantage that in this case is limited to be polynomial, but is still uh, beyond the classical prediction. Can be universal, is, un is versatile. Can be used for online processing in, in this, with this strategy of injecting the inputs and fastly process them with your, uh, with your feedback loop. And can be scalable if you are careful in the way in which you measure your system. Okay, so this would be the take home message, and these are the two main uh, references in which I've discussed the results I presented today. What's next? So, at least for me, I see two interesting directions in which I would like to go. Uh, the, we, we have been seeing in, a, in, a, in another work that we discussed today uh, that uh, you can do the cell computing, of course, with bosons, you can do it with spins, and you can do it with fermions. There is not a particular reason to choose one kind of particle over the other, apart from that you can be interest, more interested in an experimental realization, and then that's all you have. But from the theoretical point of view, we have seen that actually in, in this work, even restricting yourself to the few excitations, you have different performance when you just change the statistics. So with the same Hamiltonian, quadratic Hamiltonian again, and just with hopping interactions. So inspired by, by this and by the fact that actually the statistics, the kind of particles uh, that you are using, uh, influence a lot. We want to see what happens if here we remain in the case of optical and Gaussian and optical state and continuous variable, but we go beyond the Gaussian state into the direction of the non Gaussian. Non Gaussian offer uh, advantages in computation. This is well known, and we want to see if this is something that can be also uh, seen in, in reserve computing. Another revelation we would like to see is uh, what about a complex dynamic into the server? So before we were seeing it, you can, you can have a richer dynamic. This is a linear system, but you can have in a nonlinear system. You can have emergence of different uh, regimes. And actually, for instance, in this work with another uh, student, we have been looking that even the first work proposed by Nakajima, this work with spins, there it was uh, shown that if you are uh, in a many-body localization phase, with respect to a thermal phase, you have very different performance in your reserve computer. And uh, so the, the emergent dynamics of the reserve itself can play a role. And the way to see how this happens in this system is introducing uh, some nonlinearity into the system, and then we go into the direction in which also these systems, these nonlinear systems, can be used mainly in hybrid format, in which they can do different tasks associated with memory and then as a, as a reserve computing to process temporal task. But this is put here in the corner, but it's actually the biggest one, which should be written larger, but I'm not experimentally so. What I think is the avenue that needs to be really uh, pursued now and uh, most strongly explored is the possibility of having an experimental test of this quantum reserve computing and do it in a different platform to benchmark their capacity and try to adapt them also to quantum tasks in which you embed this quantum system and you do actually quantum state um, processing with the server computer. So I think this is all I wanted to say, apart from thank you for your attention. Uh, so let's take a couple of quick questions. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for the great presentation, first of all. And uh, I, I just wonder, like the classical reservoirs, we know that they are great in dealing with chaotic uh, systems and prediction. I just wonder how close can be one room uh, reservoir compared to the. So yeah, we the should be swimming in our car. Uh, uh, my name so is <laughs> Another working, if you actually did the different forecasting tasks. 
my glass and with the and we actually find very good performance, but if I have to give you a number to say uh, how does this compare with the currently uh, classical system, which is the There is a whole thing which we are looking at this in, uh, in this design platform actually, comparing with the state networks, and we are actually finding that the performance was similar to the state network, and, uh, and actually it was even more robust to, to noise. Uh, the, so I can give you the, the reference. This is work done by Johannes Zucala. And uh, the, the performance in forecasting with the optics of the conditions and the fair and the glass were often pretty good and they were similar. Any other question? Yes? Is, is there any particular task that you can only do with this quantum approach and not with the classical one? As a quantum, sorry? Quantum version is not a classical one. No, it's, it's, so is there a particular problem that you can solve? approach that you couldn't do with the classical one. Just be don't scaling one. No, the scaling is a major point. I mean, what I'm saying is that I can use a number of optical modes that is needed, and then you need to do the same problem with the classical system. Do you need, even for the portion scale, you need really to have a square the number of them. So if you start to give you really the size of the big size, even this square number is, is big enough. Then another task we can think about that I didn't discuss here today would be the case in which we really plug this quantum system with another quantum system. And then you have a coherent interaction between the two, and then you can do this with the coherent interaction to explode. Even if it's such a say that, I mean, I'm not telling that, uh, I mean, uh, is, uh, the advantage here is that it's easy, but it's enough to see the polynomial advantage. But of course, you can do an option, you can Okay. Go ahead. I have a question. This is the first one question uh, regarding the extreme learning uh, and also web state. So, if you did the test, what is the effective gain of having this substructure, this uh, uh, reservoir structure, uh, in the sense of if you train just this linear layer along receiving the the time series input and compare with uh, the reservoir structure. What is the effective gain comparing those two strategies? Echo stage versus. Uh, Just the, the linear? Yes, yes, in yes. both cases, the output layer on the training is linear. Yes. So we, we did it all already in that, in that way. Now the comparison is the same reference I was mentioning. Uh, I think it's, I also have the is that. Uh, in this presentation at some point. There, what we did was, uh, let's say, an, uh, I don't know if it's fair or unfair, uh -huh. but we took an echo state network in which we already allow the echo state no network to cheat and to have a quadratic number of nodes. There should be the advantage of working the quantum case. And then we just look at the output, as you say, and we are comparing performance. In this case, the performance was similar, and the only thing that would be a positive note was uh, that these are most instruments. But I would say the moment that the performance, if you have a larger to say network server, so quadratically in this case, then you could get the same performance that you get here in this case. Okay. Okay, let's close that and we can carry on with the question at the coffee break. Thank you again. Take a proper uh, coffee break and come back at uh, 20 to 27. So, good. I need to have a coffee break and start. That was it. 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 That was
Non, mon cher, mon problème, c'est que je parle de mon Non, mais ils ont des dix. Ils ont des dix, ils ont des problèmes. Mais ils ont des problèmes. Non, mais d'accord, oui, vous pouvez. Non, parce que c'est l'autre et ils ont des dix. No, allora ve lo lasciate a capo. Eh, però se non hai io non ho neanche una penna, ma ti posso mandare un link di drive. Yes. Ah, c'è tutto perché sto mandando il link di Drive. Guarda che funzioni Linux.